All right, welcome to the Cinematography Legends podcast. I'm very excited about my guest today, but uh, let's not forget our sponsors, the Fitness for Cinematography ebook. It is a comprehensive ebook uh, about a detailed plan to get you into shape for cinematography. It's it's never been done before, and, and people are always put in these awkward positions when you're shooting and these long hours. And this ebook, it's available uh, Fitness for Cinematography at gmail.com. And it's $5.99, and it will give you a complete periodization program to get you in shape for cinematography, specific exercises for cinematography, and uh, get you in the best shape of your career. So today's guest, most well-known for Texas Chainsaw Massacre, I'm sure he's talked about this, but we're going to get a little bit deeper and really get into his music video career, which it's mind-blowing, to say enough. So please welcome Daniel Pearl is on the show today. <laughs> so um, very interesting. You're, you're a Jersey guy, so am I. Um, uh, and and you, is it true that you did get your start through through the skate scene in back in Jersey? Is that right? Well, yeah, not professionally. Strictly on an amateur basis, but uh, it is where I, where I first picked up a motion picture camera. Wow, um, I, had, I had previously done a little bit of still with an old box camera, you know. Um, I had an aunt uh, um, who was into photography. And I guess my father was into it as well, although he was a mechanical engineer, not a photographer. And I guess uh, they got me into it. And um, when after I was skateboarding for a while, uh, about six months, my buddies and I, um, we, we lived on our skateboards, basically. We, I don't even know how, I remember now how we found them. It must have been through Surfer Magazine, because we were in New Jersey in the, in the early 60s. Wow. Like 63, 64, and um, we lived on our skateboards, and I don't know why, but something for some reason I decided to take a bus into Manhattan and buy a movie camera. Wow! Um, went into a camera shop I called uh, Peerless Willoughby and bought a uh, an eight millimeter, the old school, even before Super Eight, old eight millimeter camera, and um, just you know, I I did shots, just cool stuff, you know, not really telling a story, but just made shots I thought were cool. My buddies going by, me skateboarding with them, you know, stuff like that. And um, every couple of weeks, they'd, they'd come over to my house. We'd play Beach Boy Records or Jan and Dean and, wow. uh, and watch, watch the films. So we did it for a while. And we lost interest in it. Do you remember what board you had at that time? Seriously? <laughs> Do you remember the make of the board? I I wanted a Logan Earth ski when I was a kid. Do you uh, I, I, have, I have I have I have no clue of the make of the board. Okay. But what I can tell you is that. Uh, it was a wood, plain wood top. There was no graphic on it, nothing. It was just a plain wooden top. And I wood burned a surfer girl who I married 40 years ago. Wow. Girl, <laughs> That's incredible, man. See? See, people want to know this, Daniel. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> I, wood burned, I wood burned onto my surfboard. I don't have it, but, but I wood burned a girl exactly like woman that I'm still married to. Wow, today. that's amazing. I, I remember like Sims, Pure Juice Wheels, you wanted the big, big, big wheels. Now, I mean, my girlfriend's kids now, I look at the boards and I go, wow, that's not what we had. We, My dad we, made me a board. I got we, made fun of. <laughs> we were ahead of that. I mean, we, we didn't even have the rubber composition. They were, I mean, the first skateboards that we handmade ourselves were just those old metal clamp-on uh, shoes things that we you hammer down flat wow so rather than wrap it around your shoe we hammer them down flat and, and nailed them because we put screw guns and that didn't exist in those days wow we nail, we nail, nail these metal wheels to a two by four but we were lucky a two by six and um uh <laughs> if they hit anything the slightest a like, grain of sand would stop them dead so, so they were basically we roller were roller skate guns. wheels right we, we, they were they were all metal roller skate then we got eventually we got skateboards we could get with roller skate wheels and um we were kind of i was out of it by the time the composition wheels i was into roller skating uh in the late 70s when the good rubber composition wheels came out wow and and by that point i was off the board and off the skates oh okay because that was that was i remember that that point that was roller skating took over and that was the place to be (laughs) yeah but I remember seeing BMX jump, kids jumping BMX bikes when I was at the roller rink, and I was like, no, oh, I want to be outside doing that. I don't want to be in here. So, yeah, that's how I uh-huh. that's so crazy. But but in Jersey, as you know, it would be so crappy in the winter, I couldn't ride my bike, so we would watch films we made of ourselves during spring and summer, uh-huh. and that's how I got into cinematography through BMX. That's so crazy. Isn't this uh-huh. awesome? We're having a skateboard conversation with Daniel Pearl. I love there this. <laughs> 
<laughs> That's awesome. I love it. Well, so I, I, can t- I can tell you this much. About four months ago, I decided to put my roller skates on and see how it felt, and I was not very happy to be that high off the ground. Oh, I got it. So, got it. Roller blades be I, better or no? I don't know. Still, still the fact of going over from that high, you know, not having my full control of my balance and, uh, go, and, and the thought of going over from that extra height that scared me. I took them off almost immediately. Uh, so I guess I am... Uh, at this point, confined to, to to the soles of my shoes. Nice. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. That that that's fine too. I love a bicycle. You know, it's easy on the knees and everything. So. Oh uh, yeah, I, I, I do have a I do have a really good mountain bike, and I do ride it quite frequently. Oh, good, awesome. Yeah, All right, so we just live. You're from Los Angeles. We just live a couple of blocks off of Archmont, so I'm back and forth to there all the time. Oh, cool. well, perfect. To, now, not not so much now, but now I just go out uh, every every two or three days I'll just go out and ride for about half an hour or so in a square pattern and just you know just to, just to get the exercise oh that's great yeah the, anyhow uh, anyway back to cinematography sir yes <laughs> uh, so so then you went on to to go to Austin I mean how, how do you like the Austin scene uh, I mean it's when you were there it's obviously different but could you imagine it is today what it is when you were we were back there at uh, UT Austin no not at all uh, but interesting you know Austin and being and going to University of Texas is huge for me because that's so where I got an opportunity uh, for all kinds of things. So ultimately, leading to the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Um, what I can tell you is, my father was born of Russian immigrants and grew up in 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 the Bronx in the old school ghetto, which is not necessarily a financial situation, but more of a cultural enclave. Mm. But, you know, today we think of it as a ghetto, like a ghetto for all poor people. And in those days, in the thirties. Um, in the 20s and the 30s, when my father grew up, it was um, more of a cultural enclave. And he decided that he's sitting there going, like, why am I just hanging out with these? I'm, I'm American. I'm born in the United States. I mean, I'm, I'm going to go. I'm going to the frontier. I'm going to Texas. <laughs> oh, wow. And you know? so my father left on a five day journey to Austin, Texas to go to enroll at the University of Texas. And um, he thought, rightfully so, that there's, there's this something very interesting about Texas and the energy that Texans have. And uh, he really thought it was important that both my brother and I, his two children, uh, that we both experienced that. And so he made it pretty clear to us that we were going to the University of Texas. I mean, we could go elsewhere, but he made it financially, uh, you know, smart for us to go, especially because the University of Texas was, was inexpensive. Yeah, yeah. Uh, compared, compared to other universities at the time. Um, 200 a semester as opposed to 3,000 a semester. Wow. You know, it was great. Yeah. And you left so Jersey anyhow, for that, huh? Uh, I did wind up with his um, guidance. Uh, did wind up at the University of Texas, where, which was fantastic because uh, I arrived there in the fall of 67. Um, all uh, Everybody was protesting the war in Vietnam, and everybody who, uh, everybody who was doing so were bringing in 16 millimeter prints of plastic films. Fellini, Bergman, Kurosawa. Oh. You have to keep in mind, videotape doesn't exist yet, right? So, if you either if you wanted to see a Kurosawa film, for example, or a Fellini film, you needed to be in a major city because there were no multiplexes either. You needed to be in a major city in the one week, or maybe possibly a very fortunate two weeks that the film showed, and that was the only chance you would get to see these films. So suddenly, um, in Austin, Texas, and every night somebody bring it in. Bergman, Polini, Kurosawa, Godard. Oh. Uh, it's just phenomenal. Yeah, that's that's incredible. And you studied uh, you studied Russian film there, is that right? Russian cinema? Well, I did because what happened was um, <laughs> I uh, my parents wanted me to be a doctor. And the first year I was at the University of Texas, I almost didn't even go to my classes. I mean, it was a total fuck up. And uh, I was get, I got bad enough grades that if one more semester of that shit and I'd be tossed out and probably wind up going to Vietnam. Which oh. I I didn't know what I wanted to be when I was eighteen years old yet, but uh, I knew I didn't want to go to Vietnam. I knew that, so um, I uh, you know just my passion was these films, and every night I would go see one if possible. I would see two films depending upon what time they were screening. And they were great. They were 16 millimeter prints, so they had good. It was good quality. We were saying, uh, and um, you know, it was just it fascinated me. It's all I cared about. Uh, at the end of that year, I realized that there was a, a film school. Uh, 
at the University of Texas. The very last thing, I slip into the course book with a buddy of mine, a guy named Ted Nicolau. Ted today directs uh, horror films in uh, Romania and Bulgaria, etc. Uh, and they, they pretty much go straight to uh, the streaming or to DVD. But um, I was at his apartment and slipping through a uh, course book and no, nothing, 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 nothing. And the very last thing in the book was the Department of Radio, Television, and Film in the School of Communication. So um, I said to him, I said, there's a film school here. <laughs> and he goes, what can they teach you in the film school? I, said, I don't know, but I'm going. Nice. Okay. On the first day of film school, they basically announced that it was a closed industry, which it was. Just to keep in mind, now, this, is, this, this is the fall of 68 now. Wow. And... Um, uh, there's three networks, and New York has two independent stations, and Chicago has one, and, and there's PBS, and that's it. That's it for the, for television. And there's maybe a half a dozen studios. Uh, independent cinema, not really, just about to get get going with uh, Easy Rider. Yeah, but still not really not really happening. Uh, any sort of a viable you know, thing anybody would want to do or consider it all like, you know, like a joke. Um, and uh, they, uh, he, he said to us that, um, you know, so you, if you want in this industry, forget about it. If, you know, it's father to son and they don't let any outsiders in. And if you're, if you're really passionate about filmmaking, you'll go to, you'll stick with this program, you'll go on a uh, graduate school, get a master's degree. Um, if you're lucky, you'll teach films and you'll get grants and you'll make films on the weekends or in the summers. Um, but that's it. Forget about getting in the industry. About half the people got up and left. Wow. Um, they then, uh, said, uh, I left out a part of the story where I spent uh, the second half of my freshman year shooting just weird images to be part of a light show at a place called the Vulcan Gas Company, which is like a Fillmore, Fillmore, Austin, Texas. Okay. Um, and uh, I wanted to be hanging out to it because uh, that's, that's where the girls were. And so <laughs> that's where all our young guys that we wanted to be. I spent a lot of money going there. So I, when I went home for Christmas, I grabbed my camera and resurrected it and went into the Driscoll Hotel and, and, and and, and pinched a uh, crystal off of a chandelier, climbed up on a table and got a crystal off of a chandelier and uh, took it outside and put it between the sun and my lens back and forth and, and rolled on that. And then I went to like a, a headlight of a car, put, used my hand and my fingers and made different shapes in that and put it in that focus. And then if I thought I could find a blue bottle or a red bottle or whatever I get, color or some item I could find of glass, I'd pass that back and forth in front of the lens so you'd see the color shift and the, uh, the distortion of the, of the glass, the imagery. And um, so I did that for a year. But now, anyhow, so back to in film school. Now, I'm in the first day of film school, and they go, half the class gets up and leaves. And uh, he says, okay, uh, we're going to go make a Western. Anybody ever work at movie camera before? Oh. Uh, well, I'm not an eight millimeter. Okay, boom. You're the cinematographer. <laughs> so we went out, and I happened to kill it. Uh, shot black and white. Somehow they must have told me. They must have given me a piece of paper on it. But somehow I I was aware of the color filters for black and white photography. Okay. I don't even I can't even reconstruct exactly how I knew that, but I did know it at the time we shot. And uh, we went out and we shot it field of grass with the wind blowing very much like Terry Malick does. Nice. You know, classic Malick stuff with, with our hero riding his horse. We shot in a forest and, and the guy riding the horse through the forest and I noticed that we were setting up that as everybody walked down the trail the dust was getting kicked up and the sun was picking up the dust so I had everybody go shuffle their feet before we roll each time. Um, we shot in the uh, uh, as I use dramatic skies, you know, Austin, Texas has uh, what I refer to as checkerboard skies because you get, uh, unlike the boring skies that we have here in Los Angeles, which is just all blue. Right. Like today, it's probably going to cloud in the sky today, right? Uh, but in Texas, there's always like a checkerboard of, of clouds. It's always, you know, so it's, it's, it's a more interesting sky and with, with the filtration to make the blue sky even darker, uh, more dramatic, more ominous. Um, Anyhow, everybody went crazy for it right away. Oh, shoot my film, shoot my film, shoot my film. So right away I was off and running. Wow. And then from that point on, uh, I'm, a, I'm a huge believer in that, 
even though I was studying cinematography. I think that you learn by, by doing it. You know, that's what you learn. And um, so it was fantastic for me that I've put an opportunity to shoot so many student films. And of course, I'm learning with every one. And today, I want to say how many years later, but it's many years later, huh. I'll admit to you that I'm still learning every day. Yeah, don't you don't you feel like you'll make that mistake and then you'll just never do it again? So eventually, decades later, you've made just about everything you could, mistake wise, and then you're on your way. I mean, like you know, it's like oh, don't ever do that again. I'll never do that again. And then you just build off of that. It seems like that's true. Like you you do your mistakes, you only do them once, and then you put your decade in or more, and then you've you've done them so much. You, you, you know, you just would never make those mistakes again. I, I, that's what I feel. But <laughs> interesting. I, I I never really broke it down in that way. I was, you know, I was in search of a look for myself, in search of a style, which you know defines basically what I like is, is you know what I do as my style. Right. Um, but, but initially, I was more in search of a style than I was, you know, than to say oh, I'd never do that again. Um, but like as a as yeah, a martial, yeah, but very much an evolving, you know, the cinematographer is, is evolving from the beginning and still is. Yeah, it's a martial artist. I liken it to like you'll be good at a martial art, but you'll you'll never truly master it, and then you die. Like it's always for that quest, <laughs> you know. Like that's that's why I told Robert uh, on our podcast with him. I was like, look, I, I'm a black belt in jujitsu, and and. When I got my black belt, I'm like, oh, I got to start all over again because you you're always learning, and that's exactly what you're saying. You you're trying to find your style, but if I asked you right now, do you think you've nailed down your style? You'd probably be like, well, no, because I'm still still learning. No, it's, I'm still yeah yeah, and you know, I, I'm not. It's funny. I, I told you that in the beginning, I watched a lot of films, and I I watch a fair amount of films uh, today because I'm an Academy member, and also a member of the American Society of Cinematographers, so I. You know, in the in the Hollywood, in the uh, excuse me, in the award season, um, you know, October, November, December, I'm, I'm pretty busy, and I do really enjoy the, the foreign film aspect of the Academy Awards because that reminds me so much of when I was young and the films that that, that I saw. That I didn't, you know, I had very little idea of these cultures, let alone the films uh, that I was watching. Right, so I was learning filmmaking and learning about these cultures at the same time. It, it's interesting, like I neorealism, don't. Italian neorealism is like, I love it because I'm Italian. I'm like, that's what, yeah. that's what my, my grand grandparents probably dealt with. Like, that's why I yeah. love, it's, it's weird. Like Rome, open city and all these films. I'm like, I, I guess that's what it's like from some learning about the culture of my family through what I think, right. you know, is through neorealism. So it's very interesting. I big foreign fan myself. Yeah, no, uh, Incredible, and also the recovery from the war. I mean, it was quite you know the, the, the films that are made in that time are, are quite interesting, and you know we're the times we're in right now are going to be very interesting too. When this, if and when we get this thing to, to the curve to flatten out totally, yeah, and get a vaccine again and, and now to stop this particular one, uh, it's going to be interesting what happens. People will change. It's going to be interesting era. I think so too. So when you were, I have to because I'm a huge Tarkovsky guy. When, when you were studying, uh, you know, Russian cinema, what, what can I get your perspective on what Russian, Tar- Tarkovsky is? Well, I, well, what I studied in Russian cinema, cinema right, was briefly. I started to tell you that once I decided I wanted to be a cinematographer. Now I had six six semesters left, and uh, I. Everything, every single course I took was slated towards cinematography. I studied theatrical stage lighting in the drama department. I studied still photography in the journalism department. I studied script writing in the English department. I studied Russian cinema in the Russian department. I didn't get that deeply into it. Um, to be honest with you, it was more about Eisenstein. All right. And, and, the, and the early days, and we didn't really, I don't think we ever got caught up with even where where we were in time with the, with the you know, the uh, late sixties. Yeah, I think a time frame. So I, uh, you know, considering Tarkovsky died in the eighties, you would, probably would not have been up to that yet. That's incredible too, if you think about it. You were studying this, this Russian stuff before even some of their greatest ever came around. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. It's more about Eisenstein and, and a lot about the propaganda films. Uh, that kind of thing. That's and, cool. and, and again. 
you know, you got to remember, videotape doesn't exist, so it's not that easy to see films. Yeah, they're not going to import these Russian films over to these universities. No, no like how are they going to get it? How are they going to get a copy of? Wow. All those, right? You know, because it's just like it's not no digital file, no, not even send a videotape over, right? You know, not even not even that. Wow, God, we are so, so lucky now. I, I, uh. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a very different very different time and I still sort of I'm sorry to tell you I don't really like study a lot of films I watch films I enjoy films films for me are kind of an in the moment kind of a thing you know mm-hmm. and um, I'm not a guy who that studies a lot of films or films of a type whatever it is it'd be a commercial whatever uh, I'm blessed you know in a lot of ways I'm, I'm, I, well, I'm definitely blessed because I've been given golden opportunities but I've, at the same time I've, I've managed to kill those opportunities which is which is important. Um, when I got him. Mm. But uh, I am, I am, uh, I'll tell you, I'm, uh, I'm left handed. Uh, and uh, consequently, I had, you know, difficulties with reading and stuff when I was young. Um, my parents, you know, they knew I, was, I liked to collect things, so they got me the Hardy Boy books. You know, but you go, here you go, you can read these books, every time you finish one, we'll get you another one. There's 32 of them, and get going. Wow. And, uh, <laughs> That's basically how I got polished up and sort of caught up. Caught up. But still, um, you know, there are certain disadvantages to being left-handed, but I, I believe there are strict advantages to being left-handed. I think that I have a different slant on things than most everybody does. That's been very valuable to me in my career. You know, I could be involved in a conversation of, you know, you have a director, a producer, and you know, you're a writer, and a cinematographer, and the AD. And I'll have a lot of trying to, to solve the problem. Everybody's going down one way, and suddenly I get hit like a bolt of lightning. Something that's totally a whole other approach. Has nothing to do with what we've been talking. Solve the problem, but nothing came to what we've been talking about. And uh, that's that's been very useful for me. And, and I, I attribute that to just a, you know I just I just see things differently. It's a little bit crazy as well, but I, you know, right. I admit to that. But, but I see things differently than than most other people do. I am also left-handed, sir. Of, you know, <laughs> you, you, so you, you mentioned you wanted to talk about music videos. Yes, it's yeah. Uh, as you know, I'm a huge... I mean, music, for me growing up, was amazing because I sat in a car driving to a BMX race. That was my life. So music was hugely uh-huh. popular. And as I get through your your filmography for all your music videos, I, I, I'm a... I just... This is my life. You know what I mean? This, this, you're going through my childhood. People, you know, it's inc- it's a lot, uh, Yeah, I've heard that from a bunch of people. I'm very proud to have, you know, played that, that role for everybody to have, have provided y'all with so much uh, great viewing entertainment. Yeah, it's, it, it, uh, uh, like, this is, this may sound really bizarre, but the Go Go's cool jerk? Come on. Uh-huh. That, that's <laughs> what my mother brought, my mother brought me to. The Homedale Arts Center in Jersey to see the Go Go's. My mom drove me to a Go Go's concert. Uh, wow. I was like, "Wow, this, this is incredible! This is the California lifestyle. These girls are dressing the way that I think Californians dress, and with the neon colors. I want to go to California. It, it's crazy." And then you also did Rick Springfield, who was my first concert ever. <laughs> wow! So like, I can't. And I, I, I it, it's just awesome. That's going way back. Yeah, no, thank uh, you. I, Berlin, these are bands that I like. I still, I'm a huge Berlin fan to this day, and it's like, no way, Daniel was there. Like he was in the in the mix with, ugh. Oh, it yeah. I, I don't know of anybody like seriously that has a more prolific uh, uh, collection of of work than you. I really don't. I, I <laughs> no, there's, 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 there's quite, um, you know, it's it's. it's there are quite a few people that claim some numbers around. Someone actually has counted my music videos, not me. But and the, I believe that at the moment I'm about 483. But just the bands. Um, I mean, the, the, the but, artists are in, yeah. incredible. Like, I, know, when, when they, <laughs> well, I was given a lifetime achievement. I was given a lifetime achievement award at a camera homage, and they actually typed out the name of every act that I've done music videos with and taped it all together. I don't know how long it was, about 15 pages oh. long. But as you read them off, you peeled them off, and eventually it was all the way across the stage, down, flying off the front of the stage. It's, it's, yeah, it's, 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 it's quite a few. It's quite a few. <laughs> but, but I'm gonna, I'm just gonna name a couple for the listeners, because, that, you know, 
especially this day and age with how easy it is to do videos, you know, you know, with the cameras are smaller, better. Everybody wants to do music videos. It's awesome. I do them too. But, but these, these people, if, if, if I could pick five of these people to do, I would, I would call it a career, but that's just the beginning. (laughs) Let's let's, let's make a little game out of it. Go for it. You name the band in the video and I'll, then I'll name one of the, the other one that brings to my mind. Okay, so I'm doing band. I'll do band and video. Yeah, you say the band in the video, and I'll I'll, I'll tell you. Well, well, I could talk about the video. Okay. Uh, yeah, absolutely. How about Donna Summer? She works hard for the money. <laughs> Donna Summer, she works hard for the money. Oh, man. Wow, man, that's so early into it. That may have been. Wow. You know, <laughs> there was uh, a, a director named Russell Mulcahy who very much was the guy. In music video at the at the dawn of MTV, it probably never would have been an MTV if it wasn't for him. Wow, um, Mulaney, uh, Mallet, Mulcahy, and Grant, and, and Mulaney, Mallet, yeah, okay, MGMM, Mulaney, Grant, Mallet, Mulcahy. That's what it was. Yeah, okay. MGMM, uh, an English company. Uh, although Mulcahy was Australian, but still it was an English company. These guys really were the they were the birthplace of the whole music video thing that started in the eighties. And it had to do with uh, shows that existed for Australia and for England, Pop of the Pops and Old Grey Whistle Stop. So we're not going too deeply into it. If you got a, had a film get in the, I mean, film, get a song get in the top ten in Australia or in England, and you could get a video on the air, right? They knew automatically your album sales would, would multiply by yeah. a factor of five, and then the next week drop to four, to three, to two, back to one where you were when you first broke out of the charts, right? Yeah. So this was a strictly economical thing that they that they knew, and that's why these guys would make these videos. And in fact, I shot a few uh, for a company called Kramer Rockland, with director Jerry Kramer, a few of them before MTV, uh, starting even in 79. Wow. So I started shooting them. But um, uh, anyhow, uh, Russell Mulcahy uh, was a huge fan of Texas Chainsaw Massacre, he got fucked off while he was shooting a job in Los Angeles and just decided to storm out of it. He was, you know, he, like so many of the guys that I wound up hooking up with and having a good time with, was, you know, a bit of a, a bit of a volatile guy, you know, one of the sort of, you know, one of the edgier guys. And I guess that's the kind of work that I've done. I wind up with that kind of work with that kind of director. Anyhow, he stormed out and the story goes, as he's walking out the door, turns back and goes, if you want me to come back here, get me the fucking guy that shot Texas Chainsaw. No. <laughs> and, and, and out the door he goes. So, uh, so I get called and, and wind up meeting him uh, at the Chateau Marmont, legendary nut house that it is. <laughs> and um, uh, <laughs> he explains to me that we're going to do a video for Super Tramp. It's raining again. Oh. And he goes, I have to have 62 setups. He goes, 60, 59, 58 will not work. I go, 62? He goes, yeah. He goes, I know how I'm going to edit it. And I know what that means, you know, the pace of the song and the changes between verse and chorus and, and what where I need the punctuation of an edit. And this is how many setups I need. So he goes, like, okay, well, great. He goes, but I want to let you know that have you ever been to a telecine machine before? I'd only been in film printing, you know, printing with three color lights, you know, yeah. just the red, blue, and green light, and away you go, right? Um, you know, and if you want it brighter, you can get brightened up all three lights. You want it darker, you're darker all three lights, right? So um, he goes, well, in telecine, he goes, we can control the colors individual, individually. We can affect the blues. We can make the blues more intense without affecting the reds and the greens. We can, uh, we can bring up the highlights or bring up the shadows or bring down the highlights or bring down the shadows only. It's not global. It's not the whole image that gets, you know, there are adjustments. We can, we can basically pick the image apart. I said, well, wow, fantastic. He goes, yeah, so what? He goes, so what this means is that you have to do everything you can to get me to 62 setups. He goes, just trust that there's a lot that we can do in the telecine transfer to give the film a look you just got to be on schedule. You got to get me the 62 setups. So we, I went out. We did the job. We went to the telecine. Coming out of the telecine, he was very happy. He said, come on, come with me. 
he brought me to a party at the Sunset Marquee here in Los Angeles. And uh, it was an informal party, but we entered at a sort of a, a high elevated landing. And he got, he goes, excuse me, everybody, can I have your attention? He goes, listen, I just shot with this guy, Daniel Pearl, and he's the new cinematographer here. And immediately I'm getting signed up to shoot Brian Adams, Cuts oh, Like a Knife. Come on. Bill, Michael Jackson, Billy Jean. Oh, um, come Billy's, on. Billy's like, every breath you take. I mean, it's just like, oh. right, 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 you know, just immediately it just all just starts falling into place. Wow. And, um, wow. And, you know, they, they, everybody was like, um, super cool with me because, like, fuck, this guy's actually made a film. We all, we, all of us, they all wanted, nobody really wanted to have a career of making music videos yeah. as much as they wanted to be filmmakers, feature filmmakers. And here I was, I was a guy who was working in that genre, but a guy who actually had made films before. So it was like, oh my God, it was like the granddaddy of the whole thing, even though I was 30 years old when this all started wow. out. Um, and you yeah, came 30, off, 30, and you came off, what, 30, so was Texas? 30, 30, 30, 33, 34, around, uh, 32 around the start of it. Sorry, what were you going to say? No, I'm sorry, I'm sorry as well. Uh, is, is, was Texas Chainsaw, what, was it in its infancy of being an iconic movie at this point? Or was it like, people were so blown away by that, they're like, we, we got we got him for all our videos. I, you know what I mean? Because well, right it now, was, it's, it's it's like, it, was, it, was, it was an iconic movie. I mean, it was immediately immediately taken into the Museum of Modern Art Permanent Film Collection. Wow. Um, it was everywhere you went. I, you'd be in a restaurant here, people and other t- people talking about it on other tables. They'd be referencing, they'd be talking about it on the news or people making jokes about it on television. Yeah. It, it was um, overnight just became part, an iconic part of our culture. Wow. It's it a strange phenomenon. I mean, I, I realized about two or three years later, I was driving, I remember driving off on the, on the freeway Someplace, and as I wander a sign, I thought to myself, "Fuck, I may have like some people never make a film that's as well known and received with this much notoriety." And I've done it on my first film, and right. maybe, maybe I peaked. Maybe I never hit that again. Um, and I have to say that um, I have very much uh, music video got to it again. Uh, with Billy Jean and with Billy oh. Silver Dusty Stake and so many of Guns N' Roses over in Berlin. I've killed it in that genre. Like, it's but, not even, uh, Daniel, it's not even funny how good, amazing, like, if, if I just listed for the, the fans listening, like, like uh, uh, Rolling Stones, Rod Stewart, Paul McCartney, Lionel Richie, Wham!, but Maria Carey, which we're going to get to, Duran Duran, Meatloaf, Styx, Genesis, Cool and the Gang, Stevie Nicks, Billy Idol. Come on, man. It's not uh, Don't leave out Bob Dylan. Bob Dylan. <laughs> don't leave out Bob Dylan. Sorry about that. Did I, I say never, the Stones as well? I, I, My bad. I never, I never photographed two people that I never photographed. And I actually, even when I, in amateur days, when I bought my first 16 millimeter camera, I went to uh, the Newport Folk festival and um uh, uh janice joplin and big brother the holy company were there so Ooh. although i was not professionally filming janice joplin i have filmed janice joplin god you're uh, like you're like neil preston of the moving picture world <laughs> two people who, the two people I've, I've never photographed john lennon okay uh, i have photographed the rest of the beatles with different you know in different oh, dude. things but um and and of course Jimi hendrix is somebody i've never photographed but uh other than that, you got everybody else. How's that? <laughs> I've, I've, hit, I've, hit most, I've hit most everybody else. Yeah. It, I'm gonna, no, I, Jim Morrison. Uh, but here's something I, I know you've probably been asked, but whatever. It's very, very intriguing. Were you ever totally starstruck by any of these artists? Like, I mean, you, you have had Prince. You, it, this is incredible. Elton John. Has anybody ever just... Were you, were you kind of starstruck? I know it's always the job, and we all, we're all we cinematographers with the job and all that, but was there ever a time you're like... Holy shit! That's really like Bono. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm mean, a huge Rolling Stones fan, huge, huge, huge Rolling Stones fan. But they were they were totally cool. You know, Mick was a bit standoffish, but but we shopped them on separate days. And Keith was just so cool and so you know it, it involved one involved personally with each person on the crew. And so you know that's that was the band that just blew my mind. Wow. Um, but from but, but, but starstruck? Uh, I don't I don't think so. Well, you know you left they left out Tom Petty too. I'm so yeah. sorry. 
<laughs> no, but uh, like Donna Summer, I'd be like, oh, no, 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 like I, I may have trouble speaking. You know what I mean? <laughs> Donna Summer was Donna Summer was early into it, so oh. you know, eventually you have to keep in mind. Also, I I began to get a bit of a persona as well, and eventually I become you know somebody that's right. known in, in the genre. Wow. So, um. But, uh, yeah, that's true. Maybe I, maybe we flip this, and maybe Michael Jackson's going Daniel Pearl's with us today. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you know, hey, sorry, my bad for for thinking it the other way. I don't, I don't know if I can go quite that far with it. He didn't for sure. Um, but it was on Billy Jean. That was an interesting one. We showed him around on Billy Jean and showed him everything worked and you know how the sidewalk was going to light up and everything. And and, uh, and I said to him, um, "Well, we're all set to go. So uh, as soon as you do your hair, uh, we'll shoot." He goes. This is my new group. <laughs> that, was, that was the last time I talked to anybody about their hair. Nice. Um, See, yep. Go, goes back to that. You do it once, and then you never do it again. <laughs> no, you make that mistake ever again. That's awesome. No, I, I, I just it, Iron Maiden rat. I mean, ugh, I'm an '80s metal guy, so man, I'm just. Yeah. I was going through your list. The Notorious B.I.G., Will Smith. It's, it's really, inc- it's beyond incredible. I, I don't. Like I said, I, the only person I know that mingled this much was Neil Preston, but he's also, you know, he's on the, the still side of things. And man, uh-huh. do, do you? So we'll get a little technical geeky because why not? Um, you, you had built a light specifically for Mariah Carey. So I have a question being like, is there someone well, that you, you shot that you, you know, can you tell us about that, that light for her? Yeah, I can talk about the light. Um, you know, a, I posted about it on Instagram, but I'm happy to talk about it. Um, uh, it uh, Mariah, I hadn't met her. Um, she was 18 years old, and we were about to shoot her second video on uh, Sunday. And uh, we were shooting at a school in, in New Jersey. Um, I'd never met her. Uh, and actually, I was not really a ring-like shooter, but the director... Uh, proposed that we light her with a ring light and um, that you know so we built a special ring light Not that we didn't invent the concept by any stretch of the imagination but we did build a custom one for Mariah that we did we did use her first several videos but then eventually got off that lighting you know Mariah is, is unique in, in that um, believe it or not most women a lot of men want to be lit to a, a big silk something to soften the light. Mm-hmm. Mariah, we light with a hard light. No way. I have, to number, I have to put it exactly in the right spot, and I know where that spot is, and she knows that I know where that spot is, and she knows where that spot is. Yeah. All women that have, in fact, all women that have been photographed a lot, they know where the light should be. When they, when they walk in and stand and hit their mark, if they look up and, they, and the lights are where they think they should be, then they're going to let out the last element. I always say that, you know, it starts with Mother Nature, their parents, what their parents give them, you know, in, in, in genes, right? Yeah. So what kind of genes they get, and start the beauty. And then, you know, then uh, makeup gets in there, makeup does their job, and hair does their job, and wardrobe does their job. And then the last thing is us, where we, where, how we like them, and where we put the lens, right, to shoot them. And if they walk in, and the lens is the height where they feel comfortable, where they think it should be, and the lights are where they think it should be, then they let, let out that last, the intangible element that he was let out, the inner beauty of this release. When they think wow. everybody's done it for them, everybody's treated them the way they want to be treated, then they just let it out, and it's just incredible when you get that. That's just wow. e- Even down to the mil- millimeter of lens, correct? I mean, they probably understand the difference between it. Yeah, sometimes they ask about the millimeter of lens. Yeah. Wow. Sometimes they do. That's incredible. There's a great, there's a great story about, um, it wasn't me, but Barbara Streisand, one time, uh, said that she wanted her backlight to be two stops hot. Nice. Right? <laughs> and basically what she's looking for is to create a halo with her hair because physiologically we know that the, what the human eye tries to do, you try to look in the eyes of a subject and then you look at bright things. And so if you create a bright thing away from the part of the face that you don't want people to study, right, then the eye will keep going to that bright thing. Right, and then circle back and forth between the eye and the bright thing, and not stop it and, and check out that crow's feet, whatever else is going on. Right? Yeah. So uh, she, <laughs> I'm telling you the story. It's, it's the extreme of how it can get. Um, 
she's four hours late coming out of hair, I'm told in the story. <laughs> and when she finally gets out there, she comes to sit down on a stool. She goes, you know, perform on a bar stool. Sits on the bar stool, takes out a comb, and starts to go like she's combing her hair without a mirror. The director's like, wait, 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 stop, 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 stop. What are you doing? What are you doing? We just were waiting for you to come out of hair. You don't have a mirror. <laughs> she, she gestures him to come over, and she whispers to him and shows him that it's a light meter. She had a light meter built into the fucking comb so she could check that the back light what? was What? Come on, that's insane. Yeah. I love it. For real. I love it. For real. Later on, the the um, the director asked to put up the Zoom. The DP was a tight ass, didn't want to use shoot with the Zoom. And, um, which, you know, I understand that, that, you know, honorable thing to shoot with primes, but in a music video, you're trying to go fast, especially if you're behind and things. You know, you got to make up the speed somehow, so you go to the zone. And I asked for the zone. The, the DP said there wasn't enough light. And she, and she strikes and said, what are you talking about? you got a four, five, six with you. Whoa, I, lo I love it, man. I, one of my questions was, out of all the artists you've ever worked with, like, who was the most visually, like, you were like, dang, they got it down, and now you're telling me, even like Barbara Streisand, from the stories you've been told. Well, visually, visually, that's got it down. Wow. Like, you know what well, I'm saying? Sting. Like, you were like, this dude could be a DP. <laughs> Sting is amazing. Oh. Sting is amazing. Phil Collins was, is amazing. Um, Mariah, she totally understands what works for her and knows her audience and knows what what, what she needs to do. Um, I'm trying to think who else more recently I've worked with. You know, where you could uh, give them a camera and they're like, I got this. We're at a, you know, we're at a 2.8, we're on a 24, and you're like, that's Phil Collins <laughs> talking about that. That's oh, awesome. Oh, <laughs> no, that, that, that much knowledge about it. Um, well, Phil Collins actually did some acting as a child, as a child actor. Yeah, I remember some movies so, he was in, actually. Yeah, and he was in movies later as well. Uh, as far as knowing in millimeters, exactly like that, the directors, yes. Right. Uh, you know, Hype Williams knew exactly the millimeters he wants. Joseph Kahn knows exactly the millimeters he wants. Um, you know, they, they understand the feeling of the, of the millimeter. The feeling of the lens of a certain millimeter contributes to the effect, what they're after in the effect of the shot. Yeah. Um, you've mentioned... Uh, as far as actors go, I mean, believe it or not, a guy who I was always impressed with because his intuition was good is R. Kelly. No, nice. I hate, to bring up, <laughs> I hate to mention the devil, but you know, but uh, uh, you know, he, that, that guy, his intuition was really good. You know, he just knew how to move to relate to the camera, and he didn't. You know, some people are like oblivious that there's a camera out there, oblivious there's a light out there. Right. Once you, and um, you know, so I can tell you a lot more, a lot more experiences of people who didn't know how to deal with where they were and people that did. That's interesting. And of course, as time went on. You know, more and more they feel like they know, they know more than everybody else about the filmmaking. So you do have that where the artists are sometimes now interjecting themselves into the into the process, which, depending upon your sensibility. But you do have to go with it, that that they you have to do have to believe that they that they know their audience. Yeah. So you can't really argue with them about you know what they want to do. Yeah, it's true. Um, you, you've mentioned uh, I, I love this I love this quote and I wonder if you could expand on it you, you've mentioned that there are only a few shadows tolerated in beauty shots can you elaborate on that? did I say that? yeah you did <laughs> well, yeah and, and it's, it's a chin shadow <laughs> that's okay that's, a, that's the only shadow it's, it's, it's the shadow of the chin well I, I'm, I'm funny it's funny that I said that because usually usually no shadows is what you're after in, in beauty lighting because uh, it's a two still to the day remains principally a two dimensional medium and when you're in a two dimensional medium depth is shadow and what creates depth mm. so in, in beauty lighting you probably are aware that beauty lighting often has the light very close to the lens or in the case of a ring light surrounding the lens Mm. Although I, sh I should have mentioned when we were talking about the ring light, but that was a three foot diameter one that we used. And okay. It was quite a large diameter from Mariah. But, but we didn't need it on Mariah. That's what we realized after the second video shooting her that way was that she was beautiful and did not need to be lit that way. You know, we didn't have to do that. Wow, that's fascinating too, um, right? You think, you know, yeah. I want to do this, and then you're like, actually, 
It's not. That's that's fascinating as well. Well, the, the director the director proposed it the first time that none of us were going to get the meter until we rolled on. And so we said, let's just go with something that we know works. That's how it started. Okay. And then we used it through that video, and we started shooting the next video that way. But then by the time we were on the, the, the second video, her, uh, I don't want to cry. Uh, initially, we started with the ring light, and then got off of it. And I don't think we ever... I don't know that we ever went back to it until we were Wow, yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's it's, it's, so, it's such a good journey. Before, what I was saying before is that um, in beauty lighting, it's often, you know, flat, just over the lens, you know, without much shadow at all, which is, you know, it's like, so if I only flat light people, if they're a female and they sang on the album, that's what I said, people are black. But yeah, if they're a woman and they sang on the album, then they get flat lit. Otherwise, they would get some modeling, some kind of cross lighting, something going on. But you know, lighting for music videos is interesting in that often, on the performance, the artist is looking at the camera, and that's totally the opposite of dramatic filmmaking, where the artist almost never, except in rare exceptions, more so in the last few years, the artist will turn and speak to the camera. But normally, you're lighting in a music video for direct delivery, a hard sell, direct to the lens, direct to the audience. They're performing. And it just makes very different kind of lighting than than dramatic lighting. Uh, and with that, because the women always want to look young, I mean, you know, here's the thing. If you have a gold record when you're 19 years old, 18, 19 years old, that's hanging on your wall. And yeah. years and years later, you still have to walk past yourself, you know, and that, and that what you look like when you're 18, 19 years old. So the women, and I don't fault them for this, but they're always striving to get back to to their, you know, what they think was their, the perfect, you know, their, their penultimate, whether it, not their ultimate, when they got, you know, their, their ultimate in beauty, right? Yeah. In terms of their age and their face and structure and everything. So, they're always trying to get back to that. Um, and what happens is as things develop, whether it be bag, uh, you know, bags under the eyes or wrinkles or bit of jowl starting to form, that shows from shadow. So, where there is, if, where there is no shadow, there is no depth. So you can you can light out a lot of aging out of the face by putting the light in the right place. Mm-hmm. And it's, it differs a little bit from face to face, but by and large, it's about making, creating, not making shadows where you don't want them to be which takes me back to my first response to this was that it can be one shadow of the chin. Um, because usually, especially singers, all singers have developed vocal cords. And even at a young age, they have what can appear to be, you know, the, the beginning of a double chin. It actually has from them to, from them developing muscles in that area. Wow. But they often wind up with a not, not very flattering on the chin. Wayne Isham is a director who's very big on that. Always got the chin shadow, chin shadow. First thing he always, you know, always saw. Of course, he he works with a lot of men. Uh, and his, his, he's working on you know, Bon Jovi and many, many, many of his artists have been male. Uh, but right away, he just wants to make a good, strong chin shadow, you know, so that you're not really lighting that area under. On, on, uh, it's a good dramatic look, and especially for men, it's a good look. And for women too, it's just. Is, is, is nice. Um, where you definitely don't want a shadow, and this is something that I tell young cinematographers, I'm very fortunate in, in, in the case of shooting music videos. And it wasn't that long ago I was shooting Cardi B a couple of months ago. Right? So I still deal with Maya a few months before that. So I'm still, still at it. And um, what you want to know, well, for, fortunately, I've, sh- I've shot most of them before. If I haven't, chances are that while they're being made up, the makeup artist and the, and the hair, or hair or somebody is, is telling them about me. And uh, I wish I, that's something I wish I could give as a gift to every cinematographer that you know you would have this kind of a reputation because it, it just helps so much. I then ask as soon as I can to be allowed to go into the trailer, usually not until the director arrives, and that I'm allowed in there. Normally I wouldn't want to go in there. If I know the artist, I'd be okay to go before the director. If I don't know the artist, I wouldn't go in there until the director was also there with me. Right. Um, if I know the artist, the artist knows that the director is a boss, but I'll just have in there to say hello and have a look. 
right? Uh, and um, but I don't want to go in there ahead of time and have have the you know the artists start talking to me about something that's really director's business, and so stay out for that reason. But um, but I want to have you want to have a look at you know where's the problem in your face? You know, I'll stand behind them, look at them in the mirror, and I'll say, okay, is there is there any pimples today? Mm. Is there, are, they, are they getting jolly in their bags? Are there, is there wrinkles? Is there okay? And then, and then this is of the paramount importance is how are you going to do your hair? Okay. And when I tell you how they're going to do your hair, then then and only then do I really know how I'm going to keep it. Because if they're going to wear their hair down a certain way or whatever, I got to light out the shadow that might happen from the hair hanging across your face or whatever they do. And there have been not very many occasions, but I think of one in the last maybe eight or nine years where it, the scene need, needed to be keyed from a side, not from the front. It needed, it needed to be keyed from one side. Uh, and when I went and met the artist, they, their hair was hanging down on that side. So I came out and I said, guys, we got to flip the key light. And they cool grumble a little. I said, shut up and do it. There's no choice. Our hair's hanging out, down on that side. And we will, I will never be happy. And we'll just be sucking ourselves around in circles for all day long. So flip the key light. Now, flip the key, flip the fill. Now flip the back light to the other side. So let's go. So that is really super important that you know how the hair is going to be done. So that when you do set up your lighting, that you're not creating an ugly shadow on an otherwise beautiful face. That is such great, great, great content right there. Jesus, thank you for all that. <laughs> um, if you, we'll, we'll wrap up here soon, uh, sadly enough, but um, I, I've always said, I said this to Robert the day, I said, if you, you've, you've dealt with so much through your career, lens-wise, camera-wise, is there a lens you particularly really like? And, and I say this, but everyone said... What's that? 35 million. Okay, and do you have a... Depending on 32, 35, is, uh, that's a lens that I like a lot. Do you have a um, specific, yeah. do you have a, like a specific uh, brand that you Manufa like? Manufacturer? Yeah. No, wow. What can I tell you? I always said well, if you have to go on an island for the rest of your life and take one lens, what would you bring? <laughs> if I had to go on an island for the rest of my life and I had to pick one lens? Yeah. <laughs> oh, that would probably be... <laughs> Oh man, I got a lot of friends in the lens business. That's okay. So, Maybe we'll let you bring an assortment. Screw it. You know, it's, it's too. <laughs> yeah, all right. I'd have to say probably the Master Prime 18. Nice. There's something, you know, something nice about the wide angle lens. And that one's kind of not not too much distortion to it. So, you know, you can, you can, you can do stuff that doesn't look so wide angle all the time. Yeah, I said that the other day, and, and, and uh, you know, Robert did the same thing, and I said, well, you know, you have to go on an island, and he goes, "Well, all right." The, the island seems to be the clincher in this this thing because nobody, you know, everybody had. You have probably tons that you love, but I just wanted to know what is there a look of one because you know I think this helps everyone out there just maybe discover that lens or try it or or say, "Oh, that's that's what I see too." You know, so okay. Well, yeah, I mean, the first answer is thirty five because that's the lens that I like to shoot with a lot. But if I could only have one lens, <laughs> I would be I would be an eighteen. That's awesome. All right, well, that brings so, us... Right, if I could only, so how about if I could only have one camera? Uh, it would be, be my iPhone. It's fucking amazing. <laughs> God damn. This is crazy. That's, I can't believe what the photography I can do with it. I know, you know, we're, we're, how do you feel... We'll, we'll close with this, because this is very pertinent to, to what's going on in the world today. How do you feel about the camera technology? Are, are you excited about it, or are you like, ah, I don't know? How do you feel? I think it's pretty, I think it's pretty amazing. Okay. I mean, I think, I think that, uh, you know, it's changed. The cinematography has, has basically been flipped over in a way that what I'm trying to say is that basically I started out with ASA ranging, or ISO, as people may know it, ranging between 100 on the high end down to 25. I shot the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre on, on ASA 25. That's ISO 25. incredible. So today you got, you know, 800 native, 1600, no problem, 32, 3200, I mean, doable, 2500 with the Sony Venice, and it's crazy, right? Right. So that reach, right? So we always started out with, there never was enough light. Wherever we went, we needed light. 
So we always thought, okay, we will bring a key light, right? It was always the first thought is, where, well, how are we going to bring, get exposure here? How are we going to bring enough light in here that we actually shoot the fucking thing? Right, right? carbon yeah. arcs, right? <laughs> right, so yeah, carbon So, yeah, I didn't have, I didn't have any of my chains, so a 10K was the biggest thing. I had one 10K, one 10K, that's what I had. And I had to, I had to gel it over for daylight. But anyhow, <sighs> um, um, what am I saying? Oh, so we always started out by bringing light. Because it never was enough to shoot. Now, with the the combination of the dynamic range, because you know with raw, it's like crazy, right? The range of what you can do yeah. raw and a good and a good grading artist, and you can fucking make anything <laughs> work out into a beautiful photograph. Right? So it it's really changed a lot, and I don't regret it. I'm not uh, I'm not upset about it. I think it's fantastic. Uh, and what I think happened as I watch films is as often as not instead of bringing light now I think the cinematographers are bringing shadow yeah and they're and they're, and they're, and they're going into a situation going okay here's the existing light and I can give this look by taking light away and put, I take, put a black on that wall you know take this window this window down whatever so I think it becomes we were very much additive in, in lighting and Nowadays, I think it's perhaps more subtractive. Um, you know, I was also, I have to say that I was always trying to give something a stylized look. I was always trying to make something look more than what I would call National Geographic. National yes. Geographic is a beautiful picture of whatever that subject is. But I always try to take it, but, but realistic, but beautiful. And I always try to make it somehow more, something super real or surreal with it, something where, you know, the, 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 the backlight was too hot or, or you know whatever something yeah. different than what, what the eye saw and um, it's changed quite a bit yeah I believe Richard and, Richard Crudo is quoted as saying his favorite light's the one that he turns off <laughs> yeah that, 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 that could be <laughs> that, that, that could be that's um, awesome that the ones that get turned off especially now also the technology and lights now is fucking mind blowing yeah I mean that just it's just fantastic with the LEDs, and I haven't tried to get the really hard, hard edge light that I might use for some of my techniques um, out of an LED yet. I don't know if I'm gonna be able to get the shadow edge the way I like it, um, but uh, but everything else about those lights that I've been doing with them is just phenomenal. I mean, it's just, and be able to control them on an iPad, change the colors and run them up and down, and and bright, I don't say use the word dim, although it's brighten and darken them because I associate dimming with a color shift. Yeah. And so, you know, no color shift to the, to the dimming is incredible. I mean, it's just, it's just phenomenal. And so I do think that we're able to, to shoot in situations we, we couldn't and, in, in, and get images that we previously couldn't capture and, and also move faster than we're able to because as well as, not needing as much light. They're also just, the cable's small, the lights are small. Yeah. It's just, it's just, it's just uh, those are all pluses because it's really about time to be making the film and anything that helps us that, that makes the process of shoot, getting to the point of rolling faster is a good thing. And cool, right? Um, There's no heat anymore on the stages. It's it's yeah. nice, right? <laughs> so, yeah, no heat. Not, yeah. Yeah, I'm an old school guy, you know, um, uh, I'm an old school guy, 52. You know, I've been doing this for like 23 years. But I and I love that. Oh, we need this, these moles and all this stuff. But as I play around, I'm. It's taken a while, but I really love put, packing it up in my van. It's cool. It's small, uh -huh. and I'm ready to go. And like, who can complain about that, right? <laughs> it's funny because this guy I mentioned to you earlier, Ted Nicolau, he and I, he directed or wrote and directed a lot of films I shot when we were in film school. And uh, he also, I got him a job as sound mixer in uh, on Texas Chainsaw Massacre. So we we were reunited at a chainsaw event a couple of months ago, and I started talking. And I said, you know, maybe before we stop, you and I should make one more film together. Oh, and nice! Then, and then I'm going, you know, this is going to sound odd, but maybe we shoot the fucking thing on our iPhone. Oh no! <laughs> and he goes, what? And I know that, I know it's totally the opposite of, of what I've been doing, but 
maybe it's maybe it's what it should be. You know, to, to design a film that should be shot that way, that 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 technology. It's coming. I mean, because, Tangerine did it right, but but now with even the technology of today, what were I think red the red phone was supposed to become kind of a cinematic piece of equipment, and then they just abandoned the whole project. So I'll wrap this up because. Man, I, I was pushing for 45, and man, you gave me so much more, so much great stuff. I can't thank you enough. Okay. Um, well, cool. so we'll have I'm you back sorry, on again. <laughs> thank you so much to Daniel Pearl. Uh, look him up. You'll be amazed, and you'll cry like I did at all these amazing, amazing artists he's done for his music videos and his feature film. So uh, I'm going to wrap up by saying Daniel Pearl is a cinema <laughs> cinematography legend. Thanks for coming on. Mm-hmm.